Good morning, all of you. Uh, it's absolutely a privilege uh, to have you all here today in the morning. Uh, in fact, uh, just one small thing, like uh, I would like to thank uh, the India Council on Competitiveness to be one of the partners here. Please be members with us, and we are doing some great job in the area of competitiveness. But come moving forward fairly quickly. In fact, today we have a very special guest, uh, Professor Stuart Hart. In fact, uh, he doesn't really need one introduction because I think you've actually known him uh, for his work that he has done in the area of uh, writing a flagship article or a seminal article called Bottom of the Pyramid with Professor Seeker Prahlad. Uh, that has actually transformed the way we actually think about uh, uh, what call business models or we actually look at opportunities and so on and so forth. Uh, and he has actually uh, done this over and over again. In fact, right now with the Emergent Institute in India, he's actually trying to talk about uh, incubation, incubating companies, and doing something stunning. And then, of course, uh, then the whole idea of uh, capitalism, how he actually foresees how capitalism is actually going to change in the world. Uh, in fact, uh, one of the most distinguished professors that I've actually known and uh, have had the pleasure of uh, talking to, engaging with, and uh, probably look forward to doing a lot of things with him. So without further ado, Stu, the stage is yours, please. Thanks a lot for coming to India for us. I rolled in about 3 in the morning last night, you know, and sort of, I'm, so I'm operating on fumes a little bit, but what an incredible group. Just in the little bit of time I had over breakfast, you know, it's just, <laughs> what a great, so thank you for being here. I really appreciate it, and I think I'm fully awake, uh, so it's great. Uh, what I want to talk about is this notion of sustainability. This is a big idea. It's kind of a buzzword, right, when you think about it. Right? It means that people throw it around a lot. It maybe is overused a little bit, and it means different things to different people. And that's both exciting. You know, I think it's one of the things that, that makes it attractive because it seems to cover a lot of ground. But, but it also makes it difficult because nobody's really sure what you're talking about <laughs> when you talk about sustainability. Uh, or a sustainable company, you know, like Seal, Seal Air, right? Uh, that, you're, that sends a signal, but then what does that really mean? Right? So what I'd like to do is spend a little bit of time with you this morning and develop a framework, sort of a strategy framework, for how does this notion of sustainability, or as I would think of it, really the challenge of global sustainability, how does that translate into strategy for a company that's actually going to drive value creation? And I mean financial value creation, right? But the only way that you can drive financial value creation on a sustainable basis, I believe, is to actually solve social and environmental problems. So that, that's the idea of sustainable value. So I thought I'd start with a broad question. Just, you know, not that we need to be awake, but what, what, do you th what comes to mind when you hear this term sustainability? What are some of the things that immediately come into your mind that are, what fall under that umbrella? Yeah. Something that can stay for you know, long lasting? Well, yeah, long lasting. So durable. Other things. Just shout them out. What else, what, what else comes under that umbrella when you think about it? Renewability. Renewability. Reuse. Reuse. Long term value. <laughs> long term value. Farsightedness. Farsightedness. Yeah. Environmentally kind. Environmentally kind. Keep them coming. All of us together. Right, all of us together. So serving everyone. Inclusive. 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 For the future generations. Future generations. Good business. Good business. So we're already covering a lot of ground. Huh? Good ecosystem. Good ecosystem. You know, this is actually really exciting because, you know, as you might as you might guess, I've run this little kind of introductory experiment a number of times. And if I rolled back the clock maybe 10 or 15 years, and uh, because I did, you know, and asked the question then, they weren't so many ter terms, descriptions like the ones you're using now. <laughs> you, know, you know, back then it would tend to be, uh, you know, regulations, uh, uh, you know, government interference, <laughs> you know, that... It, Things have changed, so I think that's really, that's exciting, but uh, what I'd like to do, uh, because this is such a wide territory, is to give a little bit of historical context, because uh, this term has evolved a lot over the years. Uh, in fact, the term sustainability in a business context, context really only dates back to maybe the early 90s. You know, that was really, that, that's really kind of the inception of it after the Brundtland Commission report in the late 80s. Let me give you a sense of how I think this has evolved, how we got to where we are, and then that'll help set up this framework. So, 
The dates that you'll see are pegged to a North American time clock, right? So, but you can safely ignore those because the, the overall flow applies anywhere. Uh, it's just that the timing has been different, I would argue. But I'll, I'll, I'll use, kind of, this is my own life experience that I'll describe to you because in some ways, uh, the, the way that I've kind of gone through time and how I've evolved personally, you know, that's, that's the story I'm about to tell, but I think it tells the story of sustainability. Because I'm a, you know, I'm a baby boomer type, right? Like, uh, like uh, some of you in the room at least, born, you know, in the, in the early 50s. And I remember, you know, kind of growing up in western New York, you know, in the Rochester and Buffalo area, for, no, for those of you that know it. Uh, you know, Buffalo used to be a steel capital, right? And, uh, and we used to have to, if we were going to sit outside, you know, we would have to bring a towel in order to wipe off the porch furniture outside because there was so much soot. And I remember as a kid growing up, I would ask, you know, like, why, what, what's going on here? Why do I have to do this? And the answer I always got was something like this, you know, like, it usually started something like, kid, get used to it. That's the smell of money. You know, if, if you want, you know, the advantages of, uh, of, a, of an affluent society, you're just going to have to put up with some inconveniences. I mean, that, that was always the answer. And I remember being patently unsatisfied. <laughs> by that as an answer, and that's probably what got me interested in this space to begin with. But it just continued to get worse, right? I mean, obviously, the U.S. came out of the Second World War. It was really the high-volume manufacturing that drove uh, the war effort and drove the growth of the economy in the 50s and 60s. Tremendous, you know, economic growth. Uh, it brought up the middle class, you know, in the U.S. At, at that period of time. But also, the problems became so difficult so hard to ignore that something had to be done. You know, when rivers start lighting on fire, you can't put them out for two weeks, you know, which is what happened you know, in, in Cleveland uh, back in the late 60s. Then something has to happen. Eventually, there was so much outcry that something had, had to happen. Kind of what's going on, I would say, in China, or maybe even in India today. Right? And sure enough, what we got was what you would expect, and what was probably appropriate at the time, which was pretty harsh government regulation. Uh, in came the Environmental Protection Agency. In came a whole you know, set of new rules and regulations. The creation of the, uh, you know, the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act, you know, the, like just the, all of the so-called landmark environmental laws kind of came in at that time. It was really important that they did. Uh, and this is about the time, you know, kind of late 60s, early 70s when I'm going to college, right? So I got caught up in this, you know, sort of the early environmental movement. You know, that was, that was that was really what got, in some ways, the regulations that got passed, which were these end of pipe, command and control, you know, if you create this mess, here's how you're going to collect it and treat it and dispose of it. That, that was entirely appropriate because companies were not doing anything at the time. But it shouldn't come as a great surprise that because it was framed this way, it added cost, right? I mean, by definition, if your attitude is pollution control, that you would clean it up after you've already created the mess, then that would automatically mean it's going to be higher cost, right? I mean, it just stands to reason, it's common sense that that would be the case. And of course, that was the case, right? So we did see during the 70s and into the 80s reductions in these criteria in emissions and pollutants, and that's good. But I would argue, you know, this is sort of how my life turned, right? That the new problem that was created was bigger than the problem we were solving through this approach. And the new problem we were creating was more in between our ears, in our head, than it was anything else. It was how we thought. Because what happened was this, this end of pipe regulatory approach created a sense, kind of a, a mindset in people, and it's still there today. It's still there today in college students. And there's no good reason why it should be there today in college students, but it's still there that Anything having to do with environment, or these terms, like environment or, or social responsibility or social good, is going to cost you more, right? I mean, it just it planted this sense in our heads that it was going to be higher cost, that it probably was going to involve liability or lawyers, you know, or, you know, some kind of problem. It had a problem frame to it, right? And it's still there. That's still lurking. It's still lingering in our minds that would, even today I would submit it because it, if you're all honest with each other, it's probably still there. When I asked the question, you said other, other words, but that was probably still lurking in the back of your head, <laughs> right? This notion that, hmm, well, you know, I mean, the government's going to come in and pass these regulations and it's going to cost us more money, you know, and then 
even when you go to jail. Right? I mean, that's still lurking there. So it took some period of time over the course of the 80s with the advent of the quality revolution. You know, so like for me, I started to become disenchanted with this kind of stopping projects, that, you know, kind of negative impact, you know, the, that it's going to cost you the trade-off way of thinking by, say, the late 70s. And I, I went on and I did a PhD program at the University of Michigan, which is where I first met uh, Prabhupada. And this was now the early 80s. And I was interested in strategy. That's what I did my uh, doctoral work in, because I, I was very interested in understanding why would companies and agencies actually undertake projects that were really damaging in the first place. So my PhD was on, on strategic decision making. And about the same time, you know, you see the introduction of the quality revolution coming from Japan. Japan kind of coming on shore in the U.S. with high quality, low cost cars and consumer electronics and so forth. And companies didn't know how to deal with that because they brought with it a whole new approach to management, you know, with quality management and lean management and so forth. And we're still trying to figure it out, right? We made a lot of headway over the last 30 or 40 years, but still trying to figure it out. And somewhere in the, during the 80s, just as this notion of sustainability at, at the global level was beginning to pick up, uh, some smart people, some observant people, realized that the logic of prevention and quality from the quality management movement could be applied to the environmental and social sector, to that space. And so along comes the realization that we don't have to just pour this stuff out of uh, outfall pipes and smokestacks and then put pollution control devices on it. We can actually prevent it, right? I mean, this is the revolution of pollution prevention that was then christened as, uh, christened as eco-efficiency, right, by, by the World Business Council for Sustainable Development in the early 1990s. And I think for the last you know, 25 years, we've had the eco-efficiency revolution, where we can begin to purge you know, this mindset that it's just going to cost us more money, because frankly, if we do our jobs well in terms of pr internal process and prevention and waste reduction and energy conservation and efficiency, we reduce waste, we reduce risk, we reduce cost, right? all, all at the same time. And there's the prospect in current products and processes to actually get the proverbial win-win. Right? So I think for the last 20 plus years, that has dominated our thinking when it comes to sustainability. That's been the dominant strategy. But already by the mid-90s, it was becoming apparent that eco-efficiency, as important as it was as a breakthrough way of thinking and as a, as a new set of management practices, probably wasn't enough, either from the point of view of the world, nor did it really realize the full opportunity from a business perspective. So coming into the 90s and into the 2000s, you know, this is sort of my terminology. Maybe it's getting dated now because I wrote it a long time ago. Uh, the idea of greening versus beyond greening. But the difference between greening and already by the kind of 90s into the 2000s, it was clear that just doing incremental improvement to current products and processes to reduce negative impact incrementally publish it in the Corporate Social Responsibility or Sustainability Report, show all those bar charts marching down, you know, water use, energy use, all good, right? Don't get me wrong, all good. But that wasn't going to get us there. That what was increasingly necessary was to think in terms of disruption, to think in terms of leapfrogging, to think in terms of true innovation. How do we get to what comes next, not just incrementally improve what we're doing now? And at the same time, how do we begin to open up the rest of the world, most of the greening stuff just continuously improve current businesses in already served markets. But there's still two thirds of humanity at the base of the income pyramid who have been systematically underserved, poorly served, in some cases actively exploited. How do we begin to create business opportunities in that space? So the beyond greening aspect, I think, picked up in earnest in the late 90s into, into the 2000s, and we're still trying to figure this one out. This is, I think, where we are right now. We're on the cusp of this, and this is where the action is. So I, what I'd like to, if that, does that make sense? As, an, as sort of an introductory tour, you know, kind of a roadmap of maybe how we got to where we are. And it also explains, I think, why this term is so overused and confusing and used to describe so many different things. Because for some people, when they say sustainability, they mean this, right? For some people, they mean this. For some people, they mean this. And it's pretty hard to have a reasonable discussion or a reasoned discussion if you have that lack of precision in terminology. 
So what I want to do is develop a framework that provides a little more structure, uh, a little more, you know, a, a bit more of a, a, you know, a set of definable constructs that connect to value creation that can help advance the conversation, okay? So here's some buzzwords that I think are uh, prevalent. I don't know if you can see those in the back of the room. Vis are they visible? Yes. Okay, good, good. So if you can just kind of read, scan down through there, you'll probably see some buzzwords that are familiar, maybe some that you're actually pretty passionate about, maybe working on, like, you know, really comfortable, like a warm bath, you know, and, and then others where you say, oh my God, what is that? You know, like this is some totally opaque thing that you never really heard of. And, and that's, again, I think because the, the sustainability domain is so big, so wide, for all the reasons I've just described, that sometimes it becomes overwhelming. So as a manager or an executive, if you're confronted with that plate of gobbledygook, what are you going to do with it, right? I mean, what, probably the, the most sane reaction would be to just sort of walk in the other direction, right? So unless we can create some kind of structure for this, then it's pretty tough to deal with. So what I would propose is a really, really simple-minded, you know, and being a strategy professor, I, you, know, you know how strategy professors are, they like two-by-two two matrices. So I'll perpetrate one on you here, you know, but I think it's actually a useful way of framing this up. But I'll start by constructing a kind of a template, a background template of what it takes just to drive financial value on a sustained basis. And this is really what I'm about to describe is really nothing more than a simplified version of what Bob Kaplan has been working on for a long time with the balance scorecard. It just kind of simplifies it and puts it on a two by two. But I think it's a, worth, it's a worthwhile background template. So if you're going to drive value on a sustained basis, which I think is probably the objective for almost all owners and executives of companies that aren't in it just for a quick hit, right, that you want to be around, then Obviously, and this will be really obvious, you have to manage the existing core business today very efficiently and effectively. You know, duh. <laughs> that's obvious. But I think the important point here on this dimension is, at the same time, you also have to be building tomorrow's opportunity. In other words, you might say that this dimension is time, but it's not really time. Because you need to be building tomorrow's opportunity all the time, even while you're effectively running today's business. It's not first we'll run today's business and then we'll worry about tomorrow's business. If you do that, you get dead, right? I mean, so the, this is a, in somewhat of a paradox, right? It sets up a creative tension because the capabilities involved in doing this are quite different than the capabilities involved in doing that up at the top. But you need to do both all the time. And then on the horizontal axis, this has more to do with where do initiatives really take place. So if you think about the internal side, it's all about the skills, knowledge, competencies, capabilities, technologies, routines, and so forth that are necessary in order to be successful, in order to execute. And it's always easier to protect these right, and, and allow them to become really well, re well rehearsed so that people can really deliver. But if, if you do that, then you risk re sealing yourself off from the world because you simultaneously need to remain open to outside points of view, right? You need to understand what external stakeholders, how those views are changing, incorporate their views into your strategy moving forward. Otherwise, you could be tremendously efficient at something, but you could be doing exactly the wrong thing, right? But these two are paradoxical. Right? They're, they set up a creative tension. And it's necessary to do both at the same time, not one or the other. So if you, if you think of these two axes, then from a value point of view, yeah, you need to drive down cost and risk in today's business, operate efficiently, quarterly earnings. Nobody doubts that, right? That's important. But you also had better be thinking about reputation and legitimacy, preserving right to operate, kind of building and differentiating your position and view in the marketplace and in society at large, because we can certainly point to plenty of examples of companies who have done a great job here, uh, but have stumbled here, and they're not all around anymore. You know, the uh, 
WorldComs of the, of the uh, world or the Enrons and so forth, right? I mean, if, if you forget about that right-hand side, that can get you into big trouble. But that's only in today's business. You'd, you'd also, at the same time, better be developing the new skills and, and repositioning in terms of where the world is headed for the future. Again, if you wait around, you just drive the current assets in the, into the ground and eventually they run out of steam. You have to be constantly renewing, right? Sort of looking for new, new opportunities, new positions, building new skills uh, in order to, to create value on an ongoing basis. And then finally, uh, what's the growth path, right? I mean, so many companies are run very efficiently, do great work in terms of their stakeholder engagement and, uh, you know, kind of presence in the community and the society at large. A lot, you know, R&D, alliances, all kinds of stuff in terms of uh, skill building and positioning, but they don't have a compelling growth story. Like, how's the company, what, what's the vision, what's the path to the future that you see? They, they, they don't have it, and the, the result is the stock price is flat. Right? So you, you have to have a compelling story of growth path and trajectory as well. So the idea here is that you have to do all of these things well all the time in order to drive uh, sustained value creation. Make sense? I think it's entirely non-controversial. It's just basic balanced scorecard thinking. So this is kind of our background template. If you take this now, and remember that list of buzzwords? I'll take that list of buzzwords and, uh, and begin to do a little bit of sorting. You know, if you sort those buzzwords into these quadrants, then you know, some of these strategies, and I've already give, you know, kind of tipped my hand and given you a sense of what those look like, they begin to become clearer. So in the lower left box, buzzwords kind of sort out like this. Greening, emission reduction, eco-efficiency, risk management, environmental management, ISO 14,000, waste reduction, and so forth. This one's obvious, right? And how this might connect to cost and risk reduction. I just described it. It's really how we got on this path to begin with, as I talked about earlier. The transition away from just command and control to eco-efficiency, that was a big revolution, right, that got us that's why we're all sitting in the room to start with. It's what made it legitimate to talk about these issues in business schools and companies, because suddenly now it's business relevant, right? That if you do these things well, you can actually drive down cost and risk. And, there's a, and that falls right to the bottom line. That falls to the bottom line pretty quickly. So I'll call this just, a, again, at the risk of, you know, we don't want too many buzzwords, so let's settle on some language. All of this kind of stuff around emission reduction and, and, uh, and, and resource productivity, is, we'll call it pollution prevention because the, that's the core strategy. Because the whole idea is let's prevent something from happening so we don't have to clean it up later or overuse something. If we can conserve, be more efficient, prevent, then we've got a much greater likelihood of being able to achieve this kind of financial end. And this one's pretty well played out, right? It's been going on for 20, 25 plus years. Every large company in the world is doing it. A lot of SMEs that haven't, haven't even really started yet, and here, like here in India, huge opportunity in pollution prevention and eco-efficiency in the SME sector. But still, this one's pretty well understood. It takes some skill building because it involves kind of worker empowerment, lean management, you know, all the kind of things that quality management involve. But if you do it and do it well, that, that happens pretty quickly. Problem is, in most big companies, it's kind of played out, right? That all the low-hanging fruit has already been picked. More and more, it's difficult to find, you know, kind of pollution prevention and eco-efficiency projects that really pay off because they're, they're further reaches, they cost more, and the benefits aren't, as, aren't there as much. And so gradually now, from a capital allocation point of view, it becomes more and more difficult to justify investing a lot more here. That's starting to happen, right? And so you see increasingly companies have kind of crossed over to this other box. I'm not going to spend a whole lot more time on pollution prevention because I think that this one we, we understand pretty well. But over here, you look at these buzzwords, life cycle management, design for environment, green design, stakeholder management, corporate citizenship, full cost accounting, take back, transparency, corporate governance. What's the what would you say is the main difference with this set of buzzwords compared to this one? If you just look at that list, how do they, what's the main difference? Indeed, just as the dimension says, yeah. But, and, and so the implication is that 
this is really controllable, directly controllable, right? This is all inside the company itself. These are the plants and facilities of the company. This is upstream and downstream, right? It's looking at the entire value chain, all the way upstream up the supply chain to the point where materials are either grown or are extracted from the ground. All the way downstream, you know, if you're a B2B company, all the way out to the point of use, and then uh, out to the end of useful life, and then what happens at the end of the useful life if, it, if it's a tangible product, right? That, so this is really all about product stewardship. Right? I'll call, that's the term I'll use. Again, we could use different terminology, but that's the term I'll use for this strategy. And you know, just like pollution prevention is a distinctive sustainability strategy, and, it, and the value driver is cost and risk reduction, Product stewardship, I think, sets up, not, not only does it build reputation and legitimacy for the company in society, you know, in the industry, in society, in communities, and so forth, but it also has the potential to really differentiate the company in a significant way. And let me tell, let me give one example here, uh, actually a couple of examples, kind of a starting point and then how I think this has evolved over time. Because if I think about the inception of product stewardship, you know, how, how, did it, how did it get its start? It did, it did spring from pollution prevention, right? That, okay, we're doing it at our own company, but how, how do we now think about how we embed this in our product? Right? That's the obvious next step, not just reducing emissions in our plants and operations. So I'm thinking back to, because I've been at this a while, you know, I started, uh, when, when, when I was at Michigan, I started this program called the Corporate Environmental Management Program in 1990 which was a dual degree between the business school and the School of Natural Resources and Environment. And I still remember, you know, as because I was pegged, you know, Mr. Green Professor, you know, and kind of try to live up to that. So you feel like you're forced to go out and buy these, you know, new green products. So I still remember the very first green product that came on the market in the U.S. You know what it was? Recycled toilet paper. <laughs> so, you know, being the Green Professor, I felt like I had to go out and buy it, so I did. And what do you think the experience was, right? Uh, so I'll, I'll step back before I complete my, my recycled toilet paper story. Because this is, these were early days for green products, right? But I would argue that the experience lingers. And I want to do just one other little thought experiment with you in terms of, just like, you know, the idea around environment, you know, sort of still thinking that this is maybe a problem. There are some lingering, you know, kind of mindsets around the idea of green products. So before I finish my toilet paper story, what's the first thing that comes to mind when you hear the term green product? Yeah. And the quality. Would it, would it live up to the quality? Right, so the, it might not be as good. Right? Now there's, there are questions about quality and what? Cost. And exp expense. Cost. Recy and then a lot of them are the recycled and organic, right? So <laughs> then compromise on experience. Comp and some kind of compromise. So again, I've asked this question repeatedly over a long period of time with groups, you know, ranging in age from, you know, senior groups to college students, and they all say the same thing. Green products, yeah, you know, it's got recycled, organic, you know, a range of things like that, but uh, is it going to work as well, and it's probably going to be higher priced. Am I right? Isn't that, isn't that in your head? Why? Well, you're, we know why, right? <laughs> because I'll come back to my recycled toilet paper story. I went in to buy it. There I am standing at the shelf. There's the traditional, you know, tons of the old traditional toilet, and here's the new recycled, first recycled line. It's like twice the price. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it sort of looks shabby, but, you know, I buy it because I'm the green professor. I, I take it home, I use it, and it's the last time I ever bought recycled toilet paper. <laughs> because you can judge quality of toilet paper really quickly. <laughs> so. Uh, and there were a whole, these were the early green products, and they all followed that same formula. First of all, how hard is it to lob some low quality recycled fiber into toilet paper and then try to charge more for it? Anybody can do that, right? I mean, there's absolutely no, there's no sustainable competitive advantage there whatsoever, right? And, and just like the command and control regulation, I think, kind of had the pernicious side effect of kind of planting in our minds that anything having to do with environment was going to be a problem. This green product thing now has done the same thing. All of us here in the room still think green products are going to be more expensive and don't work as well. This is a carryover or a hangover, right, from 
the 90s, I would say, when all this got started. It's time for that to come to an end, <laughs> right? It's just absolutely time for that to end because there is no good reason for it, right? In increasingly, uh, and then I'll talk when I get to the upper left quadrant, and, you know, kind of the idea of green products or clean technology increasingly has to drive not, not only better performance or comparable performance, but lower cost, right, in, in order for this to really get anywhere. And I'll give one example here, and then, uh, and then we can move on to this next quadrant, which I think then just reinforces it more. Do you know this company, Novellus? Is it familiar? Yeah. Because it's owned by the Aditya, uh, Aditya Birla Group. Uh, aluminum company, right? And of course, the, the Birlas also have their own aluminum company, Hindalco. But they acquired Novellus about eight or nine years ago. People familiar with it? Yeah. Okay. It, I think it's a, it's a really, really, to me it's one, so it's great that you're familiar with it. And I guess you would be because, you know, it's, it's owned by the Birlas. Again, when I asked groups about Novellus, I was just in Belgium, in the Netherlands, and spoke to a group and asked, and like a group about the size of maybe two people raised their hand. Nobody's ever heard of Novellus. It's the most amazing transformation to sustainability company that nobody's ever heard of. So here's the deal. Here's what Novellus is all about. It was the result of a demerger of Alcan, which probably everyone's heard of, right? That's the, you know, you'd be Alcoa and Alcan were two big aluminum players from North America. And when it was done seven or, or now eight or nine years ago, the financial people that drove the demerger, you know, the unlocking value part of it, was they saw it primarily in the mining assets. So they split the company apart and uh, they packaged the mining assets because they saw that, that they thought that's really where the value was. And that got sold to Rio Tinto. And it hasn't worked out so well for those of you that, for those of you that know that industry. But the rest of it got packaged into a separate company, rolling mills, all the downstream customer facing assets you know, were in, put into this separate company that was viewed as kind of the waste product of the demerger. And that became Novellus. And nobody thought that it was going to do anything. It was initially run by like the subsidiary managers of uh, uh, Alcan that stuck around after the company was broken up and it was really doing bad. It was on the New York Stock Exchange. And that's when the gorillas bought it. Right? So they, they put some patient capital into it, uh, thank God, right? and they brought on this guy, Phil Martins, who was the former chief technology officer at Ford, who turns out to just be you know, a gutsy, you know, kind, of, kind of plant the stake in the ground sort of CEO. And you know, he, he looks at this company, and you know, everyone kind of saw it as, well, this company has no chance, it has no mining assets, and he said, you know, the hell with that. I mean, the, the fact that it has no upstream assets is a huge advantage. We're going to create the world's first closed loop aluminum company. And we're going to sever the tie entirely uh, to the mining of bauxite because it's environmentally destructive, right? I mean, primary aluminum accounts for somewhere between 1% and 2% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions. If you make aluminum out of scrap, it uses 95% less energy and emits 95% fewer greenhouse gas emissions. So Novellus has been on this path now for the last uh, seven years. They started out at about 25% uh, scrap, scrap content. They're at 53 now, and by 2020, the goal is 80%, and to double in size during the process. It also so happens, given the dynamics of the scrap market, that they have a cost advantage, right? Scrap is still cheaper than prime. So here you've got a company that has and, and they've invested at this point probably close to $2 billion to create a re the world's largest take-back take infrastructure ever known, right? Opened a huge new recycling facility in Nachterstadt, Germany, and will have to construct a take-back infrastructure, getting all the way down under the ground with street collectors and waste pickers, organizing the informal sector. So there's a basic pyramid component to this. And we'll probably have to deal with a wider problem of solid waste, because if you just cherry-pick high-value metal out and leave the rest, you've probably got a problem. That's what this company's tackling, right? And so most people would say, wow, this is way too much trouble. But it turns out, you know, that after all of this, it's cheaper, and it uses way less energy and, and uh, emits like 95% fewer greenhouse gas emissions. The company is going like gangbusters, right? So they're, they're in a position essentially to transform the entire industry and, and leave everyone else in the lurch. I mean, this, th these guys are industry transformers. So to me, this is what a real product stewardship strategy is about. That's what it takes. 
right? I mean, they, and they also planted the flag without really knowing how to get there. They're at 53% right now. And just like with eco-efficiency, they already did the easy part, right? Which is getting back, you know, used beverage cans. So they know how to get back used beverage cans. Now they got to get back everything else. Automobiles, electronics, buildings, landfills. Like, you know, how do we mine landfills? Because landfills are filled with, you know, lots of valuable stuff, right? So it, it's a really gutsy product stewardship strategy, but it's a circular economy play because, you know, aluminum is an element and it can go back to itself forever. And they've gotten, they've gotten you know, ahead of some of their customers, like even in the beverage sector, by making new can, like they have this thing called the Evercan, which will eventually be a single alloy can. Because right now you have the top and the bottom are a different alloy than the can body. But if you have a single alloy can, it can just forever go back to itself and you don't have to mix in new prime or change it. It's just alloy, same alloy, just, it just does this right? and lowers the cost that much more. So it, as I think about, if you compare recycled toilet paper to Novellus, I think we see the, you know, the kind of the gradual level, not even evolution, revolution when it comes to product stewardship thinking. This is how to, com how to completely change completely transform value chains in ways that we hadn't really even thought about before. And when you get to that point, you begin to bump up against this next quadrant, which, you know, these are like, these are like big, thick black lines, but they're actually kind of permeable. <laughs> at, at some point when you're in product stewardship, if you go extreme in product stewardship, you start to tip into this next quadrant. And I'll explain why I move it from here to the internal side in a moment. But read, read these buzzwords. Eco-effectiveness, biomimicry. Now here's some really good buzzwords. Leapfrog, sustainable technology, knowledge insert. Cradle to cradle, heard that one? It's kind of what Novellus is doing, right? Rather than cradle to grave. Right, it's a Bill McDonough-ism, you know, cl closed loops. Restorative technology. You heard biomimicry? Is it familiar? So, I mean, this one's pretty, pretty simple that, you know, essentially we should use nature as a mentor when it comes to product development and process. That, you know, nature has been in the new product development business for, you know, three billion years. You know, by now it's weeded out most of the bad prototypes. So we ought to be, you know, focused on what can we learn. So like some of the early obvious biomimetic products would be like Velcro, right? I mean, most people have coats or whatever that, you know, have dull code that goes, goes, well, that's how nature attaches things, right? Nature doesn't use bolts so much, you know, or screws. Velcro <coughs> is biomimetic, you know, or, or DuPont, you know, as a company, done a lot of work with them over the years. Uh, they run the Kevlar business, which probably most people are familiar with, the bulletproof vests. And so the, their scientists in, you know, in, in uh, both central R&D, but also in Kevlar were interested in looking at other ways because the manufacturer of Kevlar actually has some real issues. And so they began to study spider webs. And they discovered that if you actually take the web that the spider weaves and hangs from, that that material, pound for pound, is stronger than Kevlar. And the question is, how does the spider do that at ambient temperature without any toxics? Right? Maybe we could learn from that. <laughs> Somehow they pull it off, right? But, but DuPont hasn't been, hasn't been able to figure out how to mimic it quite yet. And so there are a whole, you know, many companies now have biomimetic research going on. I was at Cornell for 10 years. There are three different biomimic, uh, biomimic groups uh, in agriculture as well as in engineering. Uh, I think this is a huge future field. I mean, it's part of this exponential technology revolution, right, that you think about all of the new technologies that are emerging that are following uh, Moore's law in terms of their progression, whether it's 3D printing or whether it's distributed solar, you know, that, that we have a whole slew of emerging technologies that have the potential to not only revolutionize the way we live because of their distributed nature, but also dramatically reduce or even eliminate environmental impact in the process. I mean, ima imagine, you know, five or ten years from now, that we manufacture in our own communities or in our home rather than building huge capital intensive manufacturing plants because 3D printing has come that far. And it will, right? It will. So we have a whole host of these kinds of emerging technologies, but it's not just high end exponential technologies. We're also drowning in already existing technology sitting on the shelf 
in corporations and universities that sits there because it's disruptive in a Clayton Christensen sense of the term. That it doesn't fit the current business model, so it sits. And then, of course, we have a whole host of indigenous technologies that you know could have restorative qualities. You know, when uh, when I when I finish uh, here today, uh, and and after the holiday tomorrow, of course, some of you may know there's this festival of innovations that starts in Delhi this weekend. Uh, Anil Gupta, you know, the, at IIM Ahmedabad. Uh, but it's, it's a festival of, in of innovations focused on indigenous technology. Right? That, that Gupta started the Honeybee Network here, yeah. and it's now become the National Innovation Foundation. Tens of thousands of indigenous technologies right, coming from the villages that have been documented and people, and people have been given voice. These are also huge opportunities from the standpoint of what I'll call clean technology. Right? So clean technology can take many, many forms. It's not just high-end. MIT grade exponential technology. It's also already existing shelf technology and it's indigenous technology. We can leverage all of these things to get to what comes next, right? To kind of to, to, to leap literally to leapfrog. So as an example, how many people dry clean their clothes? Yeah. Or how many people ever dry clean their clothes? Because now it's becoming unfashionable to admit that you dry clean. Ever dry clean. Yeah, because I did. I don't anymore, but I did. So you know that dry cleaning is pretty nasty, right? Uh, the, the primary chemical used is called perchloroethylene, perk. And, uh, and actually, dry cleaning is interesting because you know, if, as an MBA professor, you can ask the question, why, have almost every, why is almost every service industry in the world that you can think of concentrated at some level? In other words, you can find a large corporation in almost every service industry Except dry cleaning. Can you name one big dry cleaning corporation? Does one exist in India? Like a big corporate dry cleaner? <laughs> I mean, there's some multi, you know, but I mean big. I mean, like a, like a big franchise operator. I can't think of one, right? Why would that be? Because every single mom and pop corner dry cleaner drop off spot is a toxic site. And most people don't want to own thousands of toxic sites if they can avoid it, right? So it just, it's never concentrated. It's a nasty place to work. You know, you're exposed to these fumes that degrades the clothes, which is why, you know, you get lint and your clothes wear out. And you're carrying around a bunch of toxics on, on your back, you know, when you dry clean. So there are a whole set of new players that have come into the industry uh, over the last 10 years that are looking to disrupt it, that are looking to leapfrog that are looking to creatively destroy the dry cleaning industry. Uh, so one company in particular I know quite well is called Myself Technologies, and it's a spin-off company. I used to be before Cornell, at, and I was at Michigan, then the University of North Carolina, then Cornell, now hanging out at Vermont. But when I was in North Carolina, out of the engineering school came this company, and the, it was a chemistry professor who invented this whole suite of soaps, surfactants, you know, clean, uh, cleaning agents, that work especially well in a liquid carbon dioxide environment. So if you take CO2, put it under pressure, it turns to a liquid, and then you can wash things in it, take the pressure off, the CO2 goes back in the tank. You don't have to use any energy to dry, right? You could make computer chips that way enti entirely in a CO liquid CO2 environment and eliminate the use of water and solvents. Uh, they're after that one, but kind of trying to go after it step by step. But one of their first uh, uh, targets was dry cleaning. So they developed a liquid CO2 washing machine, put the clothes in, put it under pressure, turns to a liquid, wash the clothes, take the pressure off, goes back into the tank, no energy to dry it, separate the soap from the dirt, you can reuse the soap, take the clothes out, they're fresh, they haven't been degraded by a toxic substance, you're not wearing that around on your back, it's a safer place to work, no fumes in the workplace, you know, uh, it's just a, it's a higher quality environment all the way. About the same price point, which would you buy? Right? So I predict within inside of 10 years, I can say this in the US in particular, the old dry cleaning industry will be gone, right? It'll be dead. And I don't necessarily say that happily because there are a lot of small mom and pops that are going to go by the wayside, right? And they run small businesses. But having said that, they will be creatively destroyed. They will, right? And that's the nature of the clean technology sector, segment, quadrant, right? 
cl a clean technology strategy is one that's, that's Schumpeterian, is directed at creative destruction. It's not based on continuous improvement at all, right? So if you have two people in the room saying, we're, you know, we're interested, we're practicing, uh, we're implementing a sustainability strategy, and one of them is talking about this, and the other one's talking about this, you can see where they have no conversation to have with each other whatsoever, <laughs> right? So like, a, like a, an existing dry cleaner would do this, they, they, they would be thinking, how can we reduce the amount of per, per shirt that we dry clean? That's pollution prevention, right? But my cell is doing this. They're creatively destroying. Does it make sense? I, mean, I, I think, so again, these terms tend to get overused. And if you look at the clean tech sector, and if you unpack some of the clean tech funds that are out there, you'll discover that a lot of the technologies that they're investing in are really this, right? They're really this. So you have to be careful when you, know, you throw these terms around and know what you're really talking about, or else it just turns to mush. I think, and I think that's a lot of the problem that we have in discussing this whole idea of sustainability in a business context. Because you can't justify this kind of investment on that, cri on that criteria, right? If you try to say, We're we have a clean tech strategy and then you're pressed to show that it's gonna do this, that's crazy, it's never gonna do this, right? The whole, the whole point of a clean tech strategy is this. And that's the basis within a value proposition for doing it, you know, that, that's how it drives value in the company. It's never gonna reduce cost and risk in the short term. It's creating options for the future. That's the whole point. But then we see some of this. The reason I put it here is because it's all about developing new core competence, new internal competencies. But so much of the challenge with clean tech has been getting it out of the laboratory, right? I mean, you, a lot of clean tech is you poured now a trillion dollars into the clean tech space, but we haven't really seen the results yet, right? I mean, a lot of input and not so much output yet. And a lot of that, I think, comes from the fact that the clean tech space tends to be dominated by, unsurprisingly, technologists. Right? I, I, I don't mean that negatively. They're great, you know? But the logic tends to be, get us the R&D money, we'll develop the technology, and then somehow magically it'll spring into commercial reality, which, of course, it seldom does. <laughs> it seldom does. And not only that, the tendency would I go a step further, which is coming back to the green product stuff I was talking about earlier. Give us the R&D money, we'll develop the technology, somehow it'll magically spring into commercial reality, and that'll probably happen first in California or Germany. <laughs> right? I mean, and that's kind of the extent of the thinking, which is part of the reason why most of this stuff just never makes it out, right? It just ends up kind of sitting there. But some companies are beginning to kind of change that narrative uh, in, in a really interesting and substantial way. But a lot of it is coming not so much from, you know, Western Europe and the US or even Japan. It's coming from frontier markets, right? It's coming from the developing world. So I give one example of a, of a company in China that some of you may know. It's called Tsinghua Solar. Are you familiar with this company? Yeah, a really interesting company right in the in the solar hot water space. The, the Chinese have, uh, Tsinghua University, the, the technology is just like my cell, it's spun out of a university, at Tsinghua University. They developed this technology for highly engineering glass vacuum tubes to collect the sun's energy. And uh, so it doesn't look like much when you see a picture of it, but if you go to China and get outside of the cities, you'll see these glass vacuum tube uh, hot, solar hot water thing everywhere, I mean they are everywhere. But when Tsinghua Solar first started 15 years, I mean, I know something, we're trying to write a case on this and it's not easy, but I, you know, we're, we're learning more and more about it. When they started 15 years ago, they spun out of Tsinghua, created Tsinghua Solar. Where would you guess, when they wrote their first business plan to get their first round of financing, where would you guess they, their first kind of market entry strategy was? What were they going after? What type of market? Deep water. Wild, yes, hot water for sure. But what segment? You know, if you think demographically, based on everything I've said so far. Right? Possibly area where the electricity is not available easily. No, that would be the that would be the smart thing. <laughs> they went right to the high end. They they went they tried to sell this to the richest people in Beijing and Shanghai. Why? It's a green product. 
right? In, in other words, they, they, they had green product on the brain, you know, that because it's solar, you know, it must be for rich people. This is 15 years ago now, so I think we've learned since then, you know, but th that was, I mean, that, that's really what it came down to. It's amazing sometimes how much strategy is driven by embedded assumptions in our head, you know. And so they did that. They, they, they blew through almost all of their first round fi financing trying to do that and, and almost bankrupted the company. So out of desperation, they did what you're describing. They went out to the, to the towns and the, and the rural areas where they discovered that there were lots of people that did not have regular access to hot water at all that might be able to bathe one time a week. And there are a lot of other uses for hot water beyond just bathing, including entrepreneurial uses. And they discovered that the technology that they developed wasn't really suited particularly well to that, to that uh, demographic. So it required them to go back and do some significant adaptation. In, in, and they involved people from those communities in that process. Also involved people in those communities in thinking about how you could create a business model where they were integral to it. They helped to redesign the artifact, but also became sales and service agents for the company itself. And of course, you had to create a microfinancing platform around it because people at the lower income level couldn't afford to buy these things flat out or buy them on credit, right? Traditionally, like a credit card. So this is what they did. It took them another you know, 18 months to two years. And that unleashed this industry, right? So this industry in China now crossed the billion dollar mark this past year. There are probably five reputable companies at this point and another 15 knockoffs. So it's always nice to know that the Chinese knock off their own companies too. <laughs> you know, so, uh, and you know, we were, so we were interviewing their senior management team and asked if they were thinking about going uh, outside of China. And they said, well, right now, you know, we're growing at 60% or, or so just domestically, so no. But within a few years, probably, you know, to North Africa, maybe to India. And then we could imagine, you know, we could add cost and features, and this could, and if fossil fuel prices go back up, you know, after the fracking boom, which they will, right, then maybe this could travel to a place like the United States or Europe. This is, you know, the, the buzzword these days is reverse innovation, right, or trickle up innovation. Uh, and uh, that's, that's really the future. I mean, they, they have a pretty bright future, I would say. And, and to me, that, that sort of strategy around clean tech is probably the one that gets us the furthest as opposed to the German and California model, right? Where you're, you have the embedded assumption that this is for rich people. Because it turns out that the glass vacuum tube solar hot water technology is less than half the cost of traditional flat, flat panel solar. And they knew that at the beginning, <laughs> they knew that. And it also doesn't use rare metals, it doesn't use antifreeze, just from a strictly kind of product design, product stewardship point of view, it also looks good. You know, if you did life cycle analysis on the product compared to uh, solar panels, right, which use a lot of rare metals and antifreeze and so forth. This is a glass vacuum tube stuck into a hot water tank, pretty much, and some medium. So that brings me to this last quadrant because that's how I see the kind of the clean tech stuff getting out into the world is by thinking about where are the unmet needs, right? So here's a set of buzzwords, sustainable development, pro-poor business, urban reinvestment, right? How do we, in the, in the developed, we're in the U.S., we've got all of these abandoned sites and cities, you know, and, uh, and toxic and contaminated places like, and, and here too, obviously. So you see people beginning to come back and clean them up. Brownfield redevelopment, inclusive capitalism, civic entrepreneurship. There's a good buzzword, radical transactiveness. I'll take some responsibility for that. Or B to 4B, you know, that one? Business to 4 billion. So this, this, is, this quadrant really is about the, the poorly served, underserved, or actively exploited or ignored people and communities and places of the world, right? Poorly served, underserved, or actively exploited or ignored people, communities, and places of the world. That, that's what this upper right quadrant about, is about. In other words, it's everything that's, that's not this. This is about the current served market. This is about everything else. That you know, everything the company, all the spaces and people that the company does not currently touch in a significant way. So this is what you know I mean by base of the pyramid. And that can be a relative term. It doesn't have to, it doesn't just mean the bottom billion, the less than one dollar a day people of the world. It's as I just described, the poorly served, underserved, 
actively exploited, ignored people, communities, and places of the world. And that's probably two-thirds of humanity and many, many geographies <laughs> that, that have, uh, have gone relatively, you know, without, without the la level of commercial attention that they deserve. And to me, the Tsinghua, Sol the Tsinghua Solar Story is a great example of that, right? That initially, they didn't see their, you know, their product as appropriate to that. But then that turns out to be the place that really liberates it for the rest of the world. And so you think about base of the pyramid, and I'm not going to go into a lot of depth. I mean, we could do a whole you know, series of sessions on just base of the pyramid. But to me, this becomes the real growth en uh, uh, engine for the future, as we were saying. This is because this is where the, all the people and big problems are, right? So how do we get after connecting up the clean tech agenda to the base of pyramid agenda? This is what I think of as the green leap. Right? This is how we bring these two together. So probably a lot of you know uh, Grameen Phone. Uh, and Iqbal Kadir, I was just with Iqbal uh, last week. Iqbal's at MIT now, as some of you may or may not know. And he's starting up a new company in Bangladesh called Bcash right now, if, if you know this, which is mobile money. Uh, and it's bigger than M-Pesa already. I mean, Iqbal is quite a visionary character. But the Grameen phone story, I think, is very instructive here, because it's similar to the Tsinghua solar story, right? For those of you that don't know it, right? That, this goes back now, again, 15, 20 years, when he really had the insight that has helped to grow this whole base of the pyramid space that, you know, as a boy growing up in rural Bangladesh and having to walk in order to try to get medicine for his mother and realize how much time that wasted and often it wasn't there or he would be sent back and he would waste it a day. And then going on and getting his MBA from Wharton and, and working as an investment banker <laughs> for a period of time. He, you know, could, he came to the conclusion that connectivity is productivity. You know, that's his, that's his slogan. Connectivity is productivity. And uh, and all the way back into the 90s, that was his vision. Not many people shared it at the time, right? Most people said, poor people need food and clean water, right? And they don't need phones. I mean, this is what, what you know. Why are you doing this? But he could see very clearly what the value proposition was from the point of view of the poor themselves, right? That. That's called, you know, kind of empathy-based business development, practicing humility. In his case, he grew up there, right, which, which helps a lot. But it means that it, you can't just sort of take these, these technologies and try to airdrop them in. It doesn't work very well. It, there has to be an empathy-based, co-created value proposition that makes sense to people on the ground, in those communities, on their terms, not from the terms of people who are, you know, well-intended people from Europe or the United States or Japan or, you know, from Delhi, <laughs> for that matter, but don't really, can't, don't know the lived experience of people on the ground. Right? So it means practicing humility, which is a rare <coughs> skill in business, <laughs> but that, that's really what it means. And so he, he undertook to create the ecosystem necessary in order to bring that vision to reality, which included teaming up with Muhammad Yunus and the bank because of all of the women borrowers, you know, in the, in the distributed uh, infrastructure that existed, getting access to the cell towers, line, you know, kind of connecting up with Telenor and Nokia in terms of technology providers, and boom, the, the thing took off because it was such a huge value proposition, right? It's really what ignited the rural telephony revolution. And, you know, we go from 1 billion with uh, access to phone service now to 6.5 billion. And Grameen Phone, highly profitable, right? I mean, this is not a game where you're playing just with low margins. This is a highly profitable, it has high margins. And a lot of people would say, well, you can't serve the poor and, get, and make high margins, you're stealing from them. Why are you stealing from them if you're creating incredible value from their point of view, saving them tons of time, and they've done all of the impact studies, you know, with Grumman's phone to show, especially in the old days, you know, now it's all prepaid, you know, so you have to, the world keeps moving. But, you know, it could show very clearly that even though the cost of a phone call might be high by the standards of, for us, making a phone call, that wasn't the right benchmark. The right, right benchmark was what's the alternative, which is walking, right? Or we're trying to travel for one or two days in order to get the information. It's a bargain compared to that. Right? So we need to think when it comes to, to the base of the pyramid in this radically transactive way, which means two-way flow, right? It's premised on deep dialogue. That's the only way you can get to a, a value proposition that makes sense from the point of view of people in the community itself. So. 
If we think of the framework then, because I know we need to finish up, uh, you can apply this to your own companies, right, if you think about this, that there's the pollution prevention strategies and give some thought to how many initiatives and how much resource and how many people are really devoted and dedicated to doing this pollution prevention stuff, which is all about minimizing waste and emissions from operations, you know, and there's the payoff. You know, you can think about product stewardship, kind of integrating upstream, downstream stakeholder views into current product systems, uh, and it's all about legitimacy, reputation, differentiation, you know, and you can give some attention to what, you know, what you're doing in that space. You can think about the clean tech aspect of de deploying the sustainable competencies or developing the sustainable competencies of the future. It's about innovation, repositioning, or, you know, finally, the base of the pyramid of co-creating new business to meet unmet needs. And plot it for yourself, you know. Maybe before you leave, take a moment to plot your portfolio. Maybe even go so far as to write down, you know, the initiatives that you can think of in your companies that are going on in this space. I would guess, I would hazard to guess that it is going to be bottom heavy. <laughs> it almost always is, right? It's almost always, maybe not exactly this configuration, but bottom heavy, you know? When I would argue looking out over the next 20 years, the big opportunities are in the upper part you know, of this model, and we tend to systematically still underinvest in that space because it's harder to make the case, right? It's easier to make the case for lowering cost and risk and building current reputation and legitimacy. Harder to make the case for, for building tomorrow's business. But that's exactly what we need to be doing at this stage of the game, I would argue. So if we think of these two levels of sustainability, one we'll call greening, you know, which just focuses on existing products and existing suppliers and you know, it's incremental based on continu continuous improvement. And the other is about beyond greening. It's about tomorrow's technologies and markets. It's about new markets. It's about market creation. It's about disruption. It's about creative destruction. Yeah, it's not about just rationalizing the position of incumbents in current industries. It's about transforming industries, maybe creating entirely new ones that don't even exist today, and at the same time getting us to a dramatically lower environmental footprint, or maybe even restoring. Right? That, that's where the future lies in terms of sustainability. It's the age of, you know this guy? Yes, so this, is my, this is my test for who are the economists in the room. <laughs> <laughs> or at least the people that know he, he's not. Yeah, and this is none other than Joseph Schumpeter, sort of the, coined the term creative destruction, the father of, of, the, uh, of the field of entrepreneurship in a lot of ways, you know, and uh, I think we're in, an, we're in the age of Joseph Schumpeter. If he were alive today, he would relish what was going on right now in a very significant way. So, you know, I just wanted to briefly mention, because I did this also, that uh, we have this thing called the Emergent Institute that we're, you know, we're starting up, and, uh, you know, we're, we're very much still in startup mode, I would say, but if we're not new, you know, we've made a push at this, and the, this is our mission with the Institute. It started in Bangalore, it's here in India, we're moving the base to Delhi, but it, we want to increase the number and success, both of corporate entrepreneurial ventures, but also new ventures by coming entrepreneurs coming from the villages in this territory, socially inclusive, environmentally sustainable <coughs> development, and you know, to create a new model for entrepreneurial training and compile a, a whole ecosystem that includes the capacity building, uh, the field support, uh, financing, uh, access to technology, kind of the, the whole, all of the puzzle pieces to try to make this happen. So if you're interested in talking more about Emergent, I'd be happy to do that. And then the other thing I just wanted to briefly, by way of advertisement, <laughs> mention is that, uh, I mean, I was at Cornell for a long time. I went emeritus a, a couple of years back and started my own company because I'd sort of, you know, I'd, I wanted to actually try to make this stuff stick out there in the world. But then I got lured back by my, my, my old friend Sanjay Sharma, who's the dean uh, of the school there and has been involved with Emergent, uh, because what we've been able to do, I think, is pretty unique. Uh, he was able, when he came in as, as dean, to abolish the existing MBA program entirely. Because uh, it really was not so good, it was losing money, so he was able to do that. Pretty rare. Like, how many other established business schools could abolish their MBA programs? And that meant that it opened up the door to come up with a complete ground-up redesign of what an MBA would mean. So this was launched for the first year, it's called the Sustainable Entrepreneurship MBA. 
one 12 month program, complete redesign, every course is new, all focused on what I've just been talking about. Obviously, you still gotta know finance and marketing and so forth, but it's all from the perspective of what we've just been talking about, the skill set of the future. So, the next 20 years won't look anything like the last, and that's it. Thank you all. Thank you.